morning, everybody. Thank you for being here today. Um, Good morning. Thank you. Who here is attending One Million Cups for the first time today? Welcome. We're very happy to have you. For those of you returning, thanks for coming along. Um, so, uh, some announcements. One Million Cups is a weekly meetup of entrepreneurs and business owners. We all get together, and, and just anyone who's interested in those things, we get together and learn about a new business or startup every week. This week, we're going to be learning about the Peoria Architectural Salvage with Tom and Janine Wester. Um, before we get to that, some quick announcements. As you guys know, One Million Cups is a national organization, and so there's little One Million Cups in cities all over the U.S. This fall will be me and Colleen will get the chance to go to an organizer summit to learn more about different One Million Cups programs, bring that knowledge back here and share it with all you guys. So just trying to keep you up to date on what we're doing there. I also have these welcome cards. If you haven't filled one out yet, then please fill it out. I'm going to pass it around. Uh, if you have filled one out at any point, then you don't need to do it. So don't worry about it. We don't have pens, so good luck finding one. <laughs> don't forget to start your PowerPoint. Yeah, no. Do you want to click it? I, what, what do I click? Just okay. Click. Um, I'll do it. And yeah. I would also like to mention that this event is sponsored by Idea Box. Idea Box helps organize organizations create consistent branding through graphic design, video production, web development, and event coordination, uh, and online marketing. Awesome. Uh, their team combines art and technology with the passion to think differently. So thank you very much to Ideabox for sponsoring us and providing us with this coffee that we're drinking basically right now. Uh, we are looking for further sponsorship for our next quarter, so if anyone's interested in that, please come talk to myself or Colleen or Randon. And so with no further ado, I'd like to hand over to Pure Architectural Salvage. Hi. Um, as Tori said, I'm Janine Wester, and this is my husband, Hi. Thomas Wester, and we are the co-owners of Peoria Architectural Salvage. The graphic just went away. Um, so we moved to Peoria in 2009, um, and we moved over in the East Bluff District, and we owned an older home there. Um, but a couple of years ago, we moved into a really old home. It's from 1897, and it's what you would qualify as a fixer-upper, for sure. <laughs> um, it had been converted into a multifamily home, and it had been rented to just revolving door tenants for 50, 60 years. Yeah, yeah. I mean, a very long yeah. time. It was very abused. So we quickly learned um, what it means to live in an old house and what that involves. And it can be extremely overwhelming, especially because the house that we came from was in fairly good shape, wasn't really a fixer-upper, good condition. Um, and so we went about trying to turn this back into a single-family home. Um, there were oops, there were doors missing. Um, all throughout the second floor, our beautiful five panel pocket doors had been replaced with basically hollow, what looks like cardboard, um, <laughs> with holes punched through them. So we were trying to find um, age appropriate matching doors to put back in to make it a home and not this, I don't, just this low grade rental. And we looked everywhere, everywhere, and could not find a door. I mean, this was. A little astounding. We were looking for what we thought was not that complicated of a process, project. And we ended up going down to Bloomington all the way 45 minutes to find a door. And we went to Old House, Old House Society. If you guys have ever been there, if you're not familiar, you should go check it out. They're a really great company. And we were talking to Laura, the director, owner. Um, and we just we're really questioning why there wasn't already an architectural salvage company in Peoria. We couldn't really understand why a city that's filled with old homes um, and old homes that are being demoed didn't have a company like this already. And why did we have to come so far to find one door? So end of the story, we found our door and that was nice. But um, we had we had to look through like their hundreds of doors to find one. And we just kept asking ourselves when we got back, why isn't this here? This is such a good idea. It just didn't make sense. And so we kept looking around at all these old neighborhoods in Peoria, these beautiful old neighborhoods with these deteriorating homes, and just kept thinking, well, no wonder there's no materials to fix them back up with unless you're going to go to Lowe's or Menards and buy everything brand new, which is expensive and is not true to the character of the home. 
And um, we also live over now by Central, and we were looking at them building their new field. And there was a neighborhood of homes there that was there one day, and I, I think it was gone like the next day. It yeah. was just like a field. Um, every home was completely demolished within probably a couple days. I, I don't really know what the time frame was there, but um, it was kind of shocking. And we were asking, you know, the city, well, what's happening to these materials? Well, nothing. They're going in the dump. So um, we were just, that's kind of like when we decided, like, we need to do something because there's no reason that these materials should be going into the dump. So we talked to our councilman in District 2, and we started trying to get in contact with the right people at the city, which he was very helpful with. And um, we talked to the city for about nine months or so, back and forth, probably actually longer than that. Um, them working from their end, us working from our end, getting everything that we needed to get done business-wise to set this up. Um, and in January of this year, we were approved by the city council to be able to go into city-owned properties and salvage before the demo crews got there. So now we um, are able to go in and remove anything of value, and we're also working with private property owners too, so we're trying to expand that way and sort of diversify a little bit. Um, the types of materials that we look for, a lot of people ask us that. First of all, we're trying to get into 1950s and older homes. We're not really interested in anything that was built in the 70s or 80s or whenever. Not that there's nothing good in those homes, but it's just not doesn't really fit into our business model. And part of that was also Habitat for Humanity kind of has right. a really good market right there for those type of items, and we don't want to step on their toes and yeah. compete with them. We want to be specialized for old historic homes. Uh, or right, they've already got that market covered, and we're not interested in competing with them because they yeah. provide a good service for the community, and we're not we're not wanting to take away from anything that we're doing, and we really can't because they're. Habitat for Humanity. And <laughs> so we look for woodwork, flooring, metalwork, ornate metalwork, um, any kind of doors, uh, multi-paned windows, cabinetry, built-in cabinets, um, staircase pieces like spindles and banisters and even the treads of the stairs, um, any original lighting that's left over, hardware like door hinges, oops, knobs, poles, latches, and leaded stained glass windows, columns, like porch columns, and there's also interior columns sometimes in the um, insides of Victorian era homes, sinks, tubs, tiles, fireplace mantles, and decorative tin work, um, just to name a few. But every time we go into a new house, we find something else that we can add into that list. Um, and many of these items people are buying to put back into their homes to add character either into a new home or to replace something that was miss missing or broken or stolen in their old home. We talked to a lot of people that have had um, a lot of the metalwork stolen out of their home, um, like hinges. Doorknobs, hinges. Yeah hardware type items. Ornate grates, basically yeah. anything metal. It's actually really unusual to find all that still left in an old home, uh, which is really sad. We have a lot of people coming to us looking for grates because they've got a big gaping hole in their floor and they have nothing to cover it with. So the, uh, the lumber that comes out of the old homes is especially desirable as well. Um, it's old growth lumber and if you're not familiar with the term that just means that it's from old growth forests. The stuff that you buy at a Home improvement store is relatively new. I think the age of most of those trees is like 20 years old, which is not very old, and they're fed with hormones, which makes them grow really fast, which results in a really soft wood that's easy. Um, it rots really easily. It's really susceptible to water damage, insects, things like that. So old growth lumber, which you can't purchase new, is stronger. It's totally dried. It's been dry for 120 years or so. Um, it's not going to warp on you when you're trying to make furniture out of it. There's a better wood grain, um, and there's less rot and insects involved with it. And most of the time, it's a lot cheaper. We sell our trim for anywhere from 25 cents to 50 cents a linear foot, and our bigger floor joist type lumber is about $3 a foot. And um, it's comparable to the price at a, a bigger store, but the wood is far, far superior to what you would buy there. That's not furniture grade wood, this is. Um, in fact, a lot of our items are less cost-wise than what would 
you would find at Menards or Lowe's or wherever, um, and they're better quality. Um, for instance, one of the man mantles that was up here, I don't know if it went through yet, but we can go back to it. Um, we sell for 300, and I just talked to a customer the other day who was quoted 2,000 for a simple, just upper wood part of a custom-made mantle, so just the upper shelf part, not any of the surround. Um, ornate hardware set, our price is $75 for an entire set, so knobs, back plates, and the Mortise lock insert for the door. Um, a reproduction set is anywhere from $150 to $200, and they work literally the same way. There's no really improvement being made upon it for spending that much more money. Um, doors, like a nice door in good condition, we would sell for 75 to 200, depending on how tall it is. Um, some of our doors are eight foot doors, so that would be why they'd be more expensive. But a new door um, at your big box stores are fiberglass. You can't buy a solid oak door from Menards or Lowe's. And they are about 1,200 for a large front door. Um, and custom made doors can be thousands depending on the tools that they need to set up to work with it. And if they're using like a machine cutting for that, that can be extremely expensive. Um, lost my place again. All right, so um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about how we market. We're basically doing everything free that we can right now. So Facebook, Craigslist, and word of mouth have been the biggest ones. Um, and a little tiny bit of Instagram, but I don't really, I'm not very good at it. So we're not <laughs> using it that much. Um, I don't really understand it. So we're operating out of a storage unit right now. We don't have a permanent location. We are looking for one. Um, and I was talking to Tori, we're going to try to set up an actual website when we get a physical location to try to bring people into that um, and get people stopping by and shopping there just like they would anywhere else. Unfortunately, we don't have that option right now, so we're just relying on appointment only to meet people at our storage space, and we're also using um, opportunities like the Moss Avenue sale, and there's a vintage, the Sunbeam building has a vintage market downtown um, next month that we're going to be doing too, so those are kind of like our, our store hours where people can just pop in and and look around. So our vision for the future is we would like to eventually scale into a full deconstruction company, which would be instead of us just going in and taking out the reusable items, um, this is a full on disassemblage of the house. So right down to the studs of the walls, removing those. Um, Recy know. Deconstruction uh, is approximately 80% recycled materials, materials in the, at the end. So uh, we're hopefully going to be working with uh, Illinois Central College. They have a deconstruction program that they just started about a year ago. And uh, we are on the advisory board for that. They needed some industry input. And currently, we are the closest industry member that exists. So uh, even though we're not deconstruction, we're salvage, it's like, a halfway point, I guess, between uh, deconstruction. So we're hoping that we can scale this, if not by ourselves with partners, or just motivate somebody else to step up that's already somewhat in the industry to start looking at recycling homes rather than throwing them in the landfill entire, in their entirety because uh, there's a lot of stuff that we can't take. You know, we're, we're going after, currently we're going after the items, like my wife said, that can be used to restore old homes, but there's still tons of materials, just lumber alone, you know, lumber alone, bricks, things like that. We, we don't have the equipment to safely take items off the side of the house that are load bearing and holding the roof up in the air. We're so. not allowed to do anything that would leave the building <laughs> structurally. And we're not insured, we're not insured sound, for that gamble either. So, so yeah. yeah. <laughs> So that's our, our vision for the future, and we would be trying to hire, actually right now we are trying to hire graduates of a deconstruction program, which is why it works so well being in town with ICC and having that program. Um, we're, we're linking up with them to try to promote that program and say, hey, look, there is a field you can go into here in town if you have this certificate, whereas before it was kind of just a 
I mean, there really wasn't anywhere they could go with it locally. You'd have to go to Chicago or possibly St. Louis or somewhere else. So, um, and that's about it for right now. We just really want to thank you guys for listening. And um, we're just really happy to bring this to Peoria and try to present a new business that's promoting sustainability in the city and um, promote appreciation for our city's heritage. Peoria is a really unique city and we're gonna to try to save as much of the homes that we can by gathering these materials and using them to build up the beautiful properties that we have that are in yeah. need of a little help. So thank you guys. <laughs> yeah. So the uh, specifics of the contract uh, can can vary. Uh, with the city stuff, that's it, it's we're kind of keeping that information as far as the business proprietary information silent at this point. But uh, to answer your question on the contract, the uh, the city, I sat down with some members in the city and we had a very good conversation about how we could put this together. So uh, with the deconstruction program at the college, we're going to try to use this company as like a stepping stone for uh, employment opportunities. Uh, so we're going to try to work with some of the organizations in Peoria that uh, are working with underemployed, unemployed individuals that maybe have a, a history that is hindering their ability to uh, get hired on. And so this type of business is an excellent segue into the construction industry because it uses a lot of the same tools, terminologies. So we're hoping to, again, back with the ICC program, uh, use this company as an actual stepping stone, as a revolving door for employment opportunities for people to get back into the industry. So uh, using, using that idea with the city, uh, they really liked that. that that's one of, our, one of our goals that we'd like to have. So we signed a contract with them, some of the contract part. We signed a contract, uh, it's a one-year contract for the salvage rights of all the homes that are being bulldozed. So all the homes that are past their, their, their rebuild stage. So everything that's currently coming down, we have salvage rights to those properties. So and it's city owned and I believe the county has some homes in there too. So does the phrase salvage rights mean you get the material free as long as you're... It's not necessarily free. Mm. Okay. Not necessarily free and... Uh, salvage, salvage rights just means we have the access to the building basically. Right. So yeah. uh, for, for an example, we, uh, we're working on a home <clears throat> on a project right now up in uh, Princeton. We had someone that reached out to us. There was two farm homes. The owner of the, the property <laughs> bought these uh, homes as a part of a farm and he needs the land cleared. He wants the buildings gone because they're crumbling. No one's lived in them for a long time. So they contacted us and what we'll do is we'll put together a, uh, a list of items and we'll figure retail value and then we'll go through our costs. We know our labor costs and our transportation costs, our holding costs, and we'll figure out what we can actually pay that individual for the salvage rights, meaning that we have a blanket. It can be itemized, but we'll ha typically have a blanket over anything that's in the home currently on the day that our contract starts. We could take whatever we want so long as it's, you know, we're not gonna drop the building on the ground by accident, you know, so uh, that's typically what that means then with salvage rights. So uh, we, are, we are not demolition, and that's one of the issues. When I was talking about trying to figure out how to do deconstruction, that's a huge issue with deconstruction. It's dealing with that lead paint and the asbestos, the mold, all those items. We're not getting that aggressive with the homes. So a good way to look at what we're doing would almost be on the same scale as like a handyman remodeler, someone that's going to remove a vanity. We're just not putting the vanity back in. So we're not busting walls apart, we're not uh, exposing. Removing, um, like we're not removing uh, like pipes that would be wrapped in asbestos. Is usually where you'd find the yeah. asbestos in the old homes. We're not touching any of that stuff. Um, and typically, if, if an item is painted, unfortunately, it stays 99% of the time, just because of that hazard. So some people ask us why why we're not taking all of the items in the home. Well, that's 
one of the reasons is because the lead paint issue. So we get that item out and it's now in our shop. Well, a customer then has to deal with lead paint. And so whose liability is that? So that's something that we're not real comfortable with at, the, at this point. So we do have a few items that I'll, I will take if they're extremely unique and painted. But then again, you know, common items just like base trim in the house, well, it's not. And you have to think, some of these items have been there for well over 100 years. They've probably been painted over with latex paint at some point in their life, which actually seals. If it's sealed right. and not chipping, then it's, it's safe. It's right. safe, but we don't really, yeah, for the most part, we don't really mess around with right. that stuff. So, yeah. But as far as our safety for ourselves, uh, the crew members that are working, respirators, safety glasses, uh, we're not climbing, so we don't have any fall issues as far as like you know, fall harnesses. Uh, work gloves, boots, uh, typical items that you would see uh, somebody on a construction site, it was especially with the respirator though, that's a big part of it. Because even, even though we're not really stirring a whole lot of stuff up, you might be surprised at how much it's just exposed in the air. And, you know, we're also running against, uh, not to sound gross, but there's a lot of animals living in these houses and there's, there's remnants of that activity. So we're, <laughs> it's, it's the dark. We didn't it, include a picture on it. Yeah, we left that show. part out. It's, it's, <laughs> It's, you know, just walking around in a building that's been closed up for a long time, there's just that airborne and type old. stuff that yeah. uh, you don't want to be breathing. So there's a lot of those type of items to be, you know, concerned with, I guess. You so. had a question, I know, a minute yeah. ago. <laughs> yeah, I, it just, like, reminds that's me of, like, going antiquing. You know, how do I, how, who, has, who does the research to determine the dates of this stuff? Maybe you answered that. Like, I don't, like, uh, my neighbor has an eye for antiques yeah and and if i was to look at it i would say oh that's an old table i wouldn't touch it so yeah. <laughs> which one do you have that has the eye for the antiques uh, it's probably know. me i i'm not you know like a an appraiser or anything like that but after you see the same kind of style over and over again, you can kind of tell whether it's original to the home. Um, and a lot of the homes, we know what date they were built, or we can look it up at the city if someone oh. really, really needed to know. Like things that were original to the house, like a built-in buffet, we obviously know that was built at the same time that the house was. Um, and as far as like pricing everything goes, I just basically pull from a bunch of different sources and try to find a reasonable reasonable average and then we also compare try to compare to newer stuff to can this person go out and buy brand new for the same amount or less and I try to take that into account unless it's like a really rare item because then I mean that kind of you can't price everything according to Lowe's if it's like a really really rare piece but yeah. <laughs> but if it's like a sink and someone can go out and buy a new porcelain sink for 250 bucks we're going to kind of have to price it around that unless it's really really unusual just because we want to encourage people to come buy this stuff and not just, not that there's anything wrong. I love Lowe's, I'm there like all the time, but we, we do have a little bit of competition there just with the mentality of going out and buying something new. So we have to kind of work with that a little yeah. bit. Now, in addition to the stuff you guys are doing with the city, are you guys reaching out to private? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. The, yeah, and that's... Right. So I'll just go a little background on that. So part of my deal when I went to the city was this type of business is extremely frustrating to figure out how the money's going to work. So there's nobody currently doing it in the city. Uh, there are nonprofits and for profits in this industry, all seem to be making it with different cities and different demographics. Uh, so for us to put money into it was a gamble. So I looked at the city, I went to the city and I said, you know, they want this. They wanted this to happen for a couple of years with everybody that we spoke with. They were trying to find somebody that was willing to step up to the plate. So what I basically said to them was, I need some sort of assurance via contract that I'll have steady flow of properties coming in while we fork out a lot of cash and hopefully break even at the end of the year, worst case scenario, a couple of years we're broken even if we realize it's not gonna work. But what that also allowed us to do then was get the business established. And so just in the last four months, I believe our sales have every single month doubled in the last four months. We're not talking tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars here, but as far as interest in the community, uh, my wife has done a great job with the marketing of that. And so now we're reaching out. So as far as an hour away now, we just had that, that conversation with this gentleman up in Princeton, but we've had people call us and, and tell us, hey, I'm remodeling a bathroom. Uh, or for whatever reason I have a sink and I don't want to throw it away. So the public awareness that there's a place to go with these items, even if they don't want to 
get reimbursed for them. They just feel guilty throwing it out in the trash. Well, there's a place for them to bring it to. And uh, so there's been five or six cases like yeah. that in the last month, probably. More so in the last month, we've seen a lot of that public knowledge and, and conversation start picking up. So we're hoping that the city, the city contract is going to sustain us while we build the, the name and the company and, and uh, start getting that outside yeah. uh, public support. So, and that's, and that's something that we're trying to allow people to realize is that if you're going to tear down a house, we'll give you some money. I mean, you're just going to throw it away anyway. Might as well have a pizza party or uh, <laughs> take the kids to Chuck E. Cheese or something. I don't know. But pay, it helps offset the cost of the actual demolition. So it's, it's a decent amount of money that we can, we can yeah. put up. Just depends on what's depends in the, on uh, what's in there. What's in there. So. Yeah. How are you guys building relationships with Realtors, remodelers, scrapyards, yeah. and things where they can see these or be in a project and say, Well, I better call you mm -hmm. guys. I'm going to throw some real things. That's your, yeah. I've cold called a lot of places <laughs> um, and emailed a lot of design companies and places like that. The only problem with some of that is. Um, a lot of the design places are looking for something that's in perfect condition so they can just put it right back into someone's home and clearly that's not the case with most of the things that we that we have so but but we do we do have a couple people that we're working with um, I, I know the gentleman in the back had it yeah we're on Facebook you can look, I, I have business cards and that I'll pass out at the end with, with our information on there. We're on Facebook. That's probably my main way of yeah. advertising right now. And it's been successful so far, um, but we're going to try to branch out a little bit into um, an actual website. And that'll probably be the next step for now. Yeah. Um, we just don't... Uh, the methods of paying for advertising aren't as effective sometimes as the social media is, which is nice because it's, I mean, it's free. So <laughs> it's been working so far. Yeah. One other question. Yeah. If you go into a, a home, is there a typical amount or certain items that, what do you generally come out of a deconstruction project? Okay, so a lot of it depends on the home, but one thing I always tell everybody is there's always something. If the home was 50 years old or older, there's always something. I guarantee it. It's something that an average person would just overlook. So we just sold a coal bin shoot door out of the side of the house that otherwise had nothing in it, right? But there's one item that I see and go, someone's going to want that, and it, we only had it for three weeks and it sold. So, because so the lady that came looking for it said, I've been looking everywhere for They've a been coal chute door. Looking for six months for a door. And coal so chute we were able to door. connect those, you know, connect her to that. So, you drive by a house that looks like it's falling over, maybe it's only 800 square feet, and you would just assume that gigantic hole in the roof and it's ugly, the bushes are overgrown, there's something in it, guaranteed. <laughs> Someone left something in the attic or it's down in the basement mm -hmm. yeah. or there's some old mechanical valve or something. There's always something in the house that's worth taking. Uh, so the, the amount of items that we get out of each home, it really just depends on the size of the home, how well it was maintained over the years, if it's been remodeled over the years. Uh, some of these homes we get into and they've been remodeled in the 1970s and all the original stuff is long gone. So Like this home had not a lot else in it, right? It was yeah. Hurt. But it had a bunch of these, and these are extremely unusual. They're, um, they're very valuable. This is what I was talking about with the, eight, the $75 a set. Um, they're extremely ornate, and even this piece here is, um, has like a, a design. It's cast, it's not, um, it's not stamped. And so yeah, the, paint, the painted yeah, picture that's what it looked, what like, it looked before. like So, yeah. you know, you would initially yeah. just look at that, walk through this house, and trust me, this house was disgusting, and nobody wanted to be anywhere near this thing, um, including myself, actually. But, <laughs> but then you look at the detail, and you go, wow. You know, and then we, put, we cleaned out probably $1,000 worth of hardware out of yeah. that house. Yeah, very Retail value. Hardware. And it's, it's beautiful, too. Nobody, I mean, nobody would have even thought, they wouldn't have even thought twice to go in there and take that stuff. The hinges of the door are ornate as well. So when you open the door, each hinge on the inside has this really beautiful, elaborate carving relief as well. It's really neat. But yeah. that building was really, I mean, yeah. in pitiful shape when we got in there. But things like that, they don't rot. So 
they'll stay there if no one if yeah. everyone leaves them there. And they were probably left there because they were painted and <laughs> looked like junk. So, right. yeah. So, yeah. Uh, can you talk about when you're starting up and you sort of still are, like a surprise yeah. obstacle that came up and how you overcame it? Oh, uh, well, we could start with figuring out how to hire employees. That oh, was gosh, a bigger yeah. obstacle than I ever imagined. Uh, yeah. All the legalities of that. We, uh, so I think that's probably, we, we did hire two part-time employees because we need that manpower to get in there to these houses. And so they're currently there are people that are close to me that are helping and they're, they're being mindful of our financial situation, which is very nice of them. Um, I'll disclose that we're paying them minimum wage and that's for now because they know, they see the vision. So they're willing to just work, they does not want to get involved and I want it to be legal and safe as far as insurance goes and all that stuff. So. Uh, but we went to Ross Miller at the Small Business Administration at uh, Bradley, and he's a great guy. And I think I've, between the both of us, he probably has six hours or more worth of counsel time in with us, and not counting emails that have gone back right. and forth. So yeah. I think I initially sat down with him probably nine months to a year ago before we, when yeah. we were just in the beginning right in the stage of starting beginning. the company, yeah. just trying to feel out what, what I'd be up against. I went to a seminar he put on, and so I think that's how we overcame that obstacle. It's still a, still a, something we're working on, and it's still a challenge. Yeah, something pops up every couple of weeks or so. It's like, oh gosh, but, <laughs> it's uh, mostly like, um, it's mostly like red tape with like IRS, and I guess maybe it's not red tape, but <laughs> it feels like it. Just uh, just yeah, lots just, of little, yeah. yeah. Just now you have to fill out this form, and and then there's this little you know fee that you have to pay, and. Then there's this yeah. little extra tax added on here, and so we don't come from a background of entrepreneurs, and so for us, this is we're going into this blind, I guess. So yeah, kind of, what? Yeah. So for it's been, it's been that's been a steep learning curve and a very large hump in the road to. It's easy to get discouraged, but um, yeah. I feel I think we're getting past that point, getting getting past it. Um, you you're doing so, all that. So well, <laughs> I just I just carry a sledgehammer around and knock stuff apart. <laughs> she does all that stuff, so yeah, <laughs> which is good because I'd probably smash the computer with a sledgehammer after a few minutes. <laughs> is that because it's mission-based? I mean, is it purpose-driven? Is that how you're able to get over that? We feel like we just have to do it. Yeah, I, I mean, it's yeah. not an option at this point to just walk away from it because of something silly like that. Um, and it, all businesses have to do this stuff, so it's just like, well, everyone else has done it, and now we're going to do it too. So, yeah. But, yeah, it is mission-based. I mean, there's, that's the whole... The whole thought behind the company is just part aggravation, part love, you know, just all kind of intertwined. So, yeah, it's like we're not going to let that stop the company from growing the frustrations of hiring employees for us. I'm sure the next person we hire is going to be like, what were we crying about? And spending all that time up late at night, it'll be an easy walk for us, I'm sure. But, yeah, that, that was a Big home. You do have a, a website. Right? We have a Facebook page that we're using basically as our website right now. It's got all the pictures up and there. These pictures are on there. Yeah, all these are on there plus many, many, many more that I did not have time to to upload onto the onto the PowerPoint. Everything's updated, so if it doesn't say sold on it, it's available, and that's basically what we're using for now. And just trying to encourage people to come out and meet us at our storage place and look around. And the sales are really good for that too. Those like Moss Avenue and the be market those are been kind of our our chances to let people come and browse if they are worried about making an appointment with us or something so mm -hmm. I yeah. don't oh. uh, we're, we're currently renting a it's a, it's technically I guess a storage facility yes. it's it's like a commercial row of garages off of Gale um, Gale and Forest Hill area of the city uh, I actually have an appointment today. That we're, we're looking for a, a retail location. We're trying, aggressively trying to find a place where we can set up shop. But that's the, the next hurdle then for us. I guess the next hump in the road is going to be, uh, I've already looked into what some of the requirements are to have a retail as far as you know, ADA compliance, sprinklers, fire exits, parking lot striping. And so I'll find a property for lease or, or for to buy, and then it quickly just gets way too expensive for the type of money that we're bringing in. And it's like, well, do we definitely take a loss for the next year or so? And then we kind of go back and forth and just try to figure out what the best avenue is. Currently, using the warehouse and appointment only has been fantastic because the costs have been extremely low. You know, the warehouse space is cheap, a couple hundred bucks a month for a thousand square feet space. But the problem is we've filled it. 
And we've yeah, been turning inventory yeah. fast and we've already filled a thousand square foot facility. And we need to have that variety because we have customers that come to us for an item that sat there for two months. So I'm tripping over this item for two months and then all of a sudden someone buys all 10 that I had within like a weekend, gone. Yeah. So, yeah. So. Is there a way you could actually, uh, or the city could actually, could you deal to host you guys? Because your mission is so much of a yeah. cultural heritage, as you put it, that yeah. I would say the city would have, it would be a benefit to them to actually host a warehouse uh, and donate or give you a deal of uh, having a, a space for you. And right. I. Well, I think their hands are tied because we're not. Yeah, I think uh, yeah. That one of the issues there is we're a for-profit company. We're not non-for-profit, and that was part of the issue with the contract. Yeah. I guess was you know that was one of the main. Uh, problems. That was one of the, the one of the items that we had to navigate, so we didn't end up in court for violating. I don't know. Well, but isn't the city trying to also make money? I mean, it's a, it's an enterprise that is trying to be at least. Yeah. Right. Right. Or, I don't know, but at the end of the day, I bet they have so much property is available that it's not even used. Right. Make it to good use with your. With your right. Property. We've I've I have had that conversation. It's been a while since we discussed that. Uh, at the time, they didn't they didn't have any space because I actually asked them that. Mm -hmm. But though, from time to time, uh, there was there's an example they gave me. Uh, buildings will come to them by owners, banks that they don't want them and they get abandoned. There is, they need work. There are buildings that need that you know, restoration process, even of themselves. Uh, and so we, we've been kind of hanging on, trying to see if something like that comes up as far as a, you know, a free or a low, very low cost commercial building. Because if we buy something, we want to buy a building that's A, in a neighborhood that can, use a, that can use the money that's coming in to help bring a facelift to that particular block. Uh, and B, we want to save an old building that is potentially going to see the wrecking ball in five or ten years. And C, we don't have a lot of money. So it kind of all fits together real nicely. <laughs> so, uh, I think she had a question over here. Um, yeah. I think you said earlier that um, no one else is doing this for the city. I have two questions. One, when you, do you, who do you see as your competitors? And I did hear you say that you all are for profit. Mm -hmm. So maybe you're saying that there's nobody else doing this, anybody else is doing this is, is for but not for profit. And then number two, when you pull this stuff out of the houses, you know, you might pull out a sink that's, I'm kind of a general boat, you might pull out a sink that's kind of like absolutely filthy or a toilet that's absolutely filthy. <laughs> sometimes me, sometimes no one. <laughs> it's kind of the the volume that we get things in is um, so overwhelming sometimes that there's no way that I can go through and clean it. So it's salvage. Sometimes it's kind of gross, but <laughs> if it's something that's valuable or we're asking, you know, a decent price for, I don't expect the customer to just take us on our word like, oh, it'll clean up. So if we're selling a sink for 300 bucks, I'll clean it. I'll, I'll go in and I'll, you know, I'll scrub it with bleach and make it look pretty so someone can come in and know what they're getting. Um, some people don't care. Some people won't touch it if it's clean. So if I, when I have time, I do go in right, and, and clean time. stuff up, especially if it's like really gross. I, I obviously don't expect no, people to touch things that are oh, like here. really icky. Oh yeah, yeah, <laughs> that, that's the least. So yeah, they're really, okay, there is not anyone doing this in Peoria, profit or non-profit. There's nobody right doing now. it in a structured environment. An no, actual no. business. There right. are people that are going in whether they're just going into houses that I think are, that they think are abandoned and doing this. Um, some people, I, I've, I've spoken to with, with people that are doing similar work. They just don't have the structure uh, as far as the business goes. They'll take an item if there's an opportunity or if they know somebody that's tearing a building down, they'll grab some items before it does hit the dust. They're not taking everything. They're maybe taking just a few things that they want. So salvage is happening. It's just not happening on a business scale. So there's, there's nobody actually taking all those items, warehousing those items, and then making a mass quantity of uh, material available to the public where an individual that's working on their house can go shop for a specific item. I mean, that was some of our criticism was, 
Uh, that'll never work because I tried selling a door and nobody ever came to buy it. And we got a lot of those uh, type of uh, people, those, like the naysayers, I guess, telling us that's not going to work. Don't even waste your time. I tried that. But when you put it all together in one warehouse and people can shop, then there's a centralized location and that does not exist currently. We are the closest thing to that actual Yeah, I guess the scale model. is the... And I'm sorry, I have to leave in about five minutes, so I'm going to try to answer. I'll be here. She, 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 Mm -hmm. It's not exactly the same. It's called Callahan. Yeah, we've yeah. been there. You've been there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he's, he's done really well with it. Yeah. They're beautiful. Yeah, they have really nice They have nice beautiful items too. up there. Yeah. Uh, I love it. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Okay. 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 That name sounds familiar. Yeah. I swear I've seen that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We'll remember Thank that. You. Thank yeah. you. Has to leave. Um, we like to ask all of our presenters, what can the people of One Million Cups do for you guys? Uh, we know about. Uh, positive criticism, I guess. Is I, know, I think we've heard some of that already tonight or today, but. Uh, and um, it just referring people to our Facebook page because that's basically how we're getting the most amount of exposure right now. And if you know anyone that's looking for anything um, and you think it possibly could be something that we already have or could get for them, refer them to us. Referrals for people knocking down old buildings as well. I mean, really just any, any sort of word of mouth. Like, oh, hey, did you know that this is going on in Peoria and they're on Facebook and go follow them sort of thing would be really helpful because that's a ripple effect. For every person that likes our page, there's a handful of other people that see them like it or see them comment or see them like one of our posts. So, uh, 3,000 followers? No, no, 1,300 no, no, no. 1, followers. Like th almost 1,300 so far in like four months of the wow. Facebook page wow. being up. So yeah. it's been, it's grown pretty fast. I mean, obviously that's tapered out over over the last like two months, but right. it's still, it's still growing. So, yeah. <laughs> okay, great. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, thank you guys. Thank you. <laughs>